One leading theory is that his stomach blocked his view of the control panel. Even <laughs> I am Tyler False, I'm a nuclear engineer with a little over 10 years of experience in the commercial nuclear power industry. From engineering to operations to emergency response, I don't claim to know everything there is nuclear, but I can certainly share some knowledge. Today we're going to be looking at a video by Real Engineering called The Uncertain Future of Nuclear Power. Let's see what they have to say. Over the past five decades, nuclear power has prevented the release of 50 gigatons of carbon dioxide. That's equivalent to two years of total global energy generation related emissions. It produces so much, it can offset so much of the uh, fossil fuels, coal, natural gas, a lot of the heavy emitters. Nuclear power is the most powerful tool at our disposal to stop human-driven climate change in its tracks. Yet, powerful industrial countries like Germany have turned their back on this technology, rapidly deactivating power plants prematurely. That's really sad to see, and a lot it's just driven by fear and overblown issues like nuclear waste when nuclear waste is really safely stored on site at nuclear power plants. To people in the industry, it's not really an issue. Nuclear power, despite its clear climate change fighting potential, carries inherent risks that have hampered political will to invest in the technology. Political risks and perceived risks. As far as actual safety risks, not so much. In order to thrive and help our planet overcome its greatest challenge, nuclear power needs to evolve. This is... Okay. The message needs to evolve. The future of nuclear power. We can't begin to address the solutions of the future without addressing the failures of the past. Many of the most notorious nuclear meltdowns were caused by errors in coolant systems. Take the Three Mile Island... Errors in coolant systems. Um, Chernobyl, the most infamous one, was about a crazy test. <laughs> and poor design associated with the moderator. So that one, not really a coolant thing, but let's see what they have to say. Special meltdown incident of 1979. The incident began with a mechanical failure in the plant's cooling system. It all started... The secondary loop. So as you see on this drawing right here, it's going to be in this non-nuclear loop. Um, it was an issue with a uh, condensate and feed water system of supplying the secondary or non-nuclear portion. Steam generators stopped receiving water due to a... Even says so on their graph right there, non-nuclear. Um, so the terminology I'm familiar with, when we say coolant system, it's that primary loop right there that he shows when he says reactor build. And this is a pretty good drawing, though. Multi clogged filter. The loss of water yeah. meant that the re Yeah, the filter, yeah, right, was in the condensate polishing system or, con or condensate system where it says blocked. His energy didn't have anywhere to go, raising the temperature of the reactor. As the pre So, just a bit of a thing. It, it does affect the, the reactor, but just to show you, it affected feed flow to the steam generator, which once a, when you lower the feed flow, which is the coolant part for the... Uh, for the steam generator primary to secondary heat exchanger that causes reactor temperature to go up so this hasn't been an issue with a reactor coolant system at least not yet rose due to the water being boiled a relief valve opened a valve designed to only open for 10 seconds but another fault resulted in the valve staying open allowing the precious coolant inside the reactor to escape pushing temperatures even higher as the core temperature continued to rise, the reactor operators received conflicting information from the control room. The emergency water system that should provide extra water to the cores was blocked. Two days earlier, the plant was closed due to maintenance, and the valves from the emergency coolant were closed. So this emergency coolant, um, in the plant I worked at, we called it auxiliary feed water. So again, we're talking secondary side of the... Uh, with the secondary loop of the plant, so that was feeding the steam generator. The auxiliary feed water system should have been supplying, um, supplying water to the steam generator immediately. It automatically does so after the reactor is safely emergency shut down, which it, which it was in this case. But those valves were inadvertently left closed. 
This is what is called a plant status control event. And what that means is when equipment is left in an improper configuration due to human error. So the fact that the operators were not, a, were not even aware of this, because that is a normal condition that operators even back then were trained on after a normal reactor trip, shows serious flaws with the training of the reactor operators. One thing I would add about Three Mile Island, I'm going to go out on a limb and say there no, wasn't really that much of a design problem, at least compared to Chernobyl. But, I mean, yes, improvements were made, but the big learnings was it was a complete failure by the operations crew. The reactor operators should have known better. Fortunately, they were not reopened when the reactor was restarted. The operator should have noticed that these valves were closed, but yep. for unknown reasons, he didn't see the warning lights on his control panel. One leading theory is that his stomach blocked his view of the control panel. Even <laughs> I haven't actually heard this one uh, before, and I've studied this event extensively. Um, so I was in... I was a shift supervisor for an operations crew, and we regularly train our crews on this exact scenario. You're required to even do this scenario past the Three Mile Island scenario in order to be a reactor operator. Um, the reactor I worked at was a similar design um, in, in that it was a pressurized water reactor. So <laughs> I haven't heard the belly one. I've heard um, danger tags. Like there are so many equipment out of service that tags for equipment being out of service were covering and blocking some indications, but I've never heard I've never heard the belly one. That's uh that's interesting. Then the NRC, the regulatory body governing nuclear safety, had a rule that if the emergency coolant valves were closed, the reactor must be shut down. So this is what is known as technical specifications and limiting conditions for operation. If any sort of safety system, and an auxiliary feed water is an example of a safety system, then is placed out of service, you have a time limit to fix it, before, otherwise you can't operate that plant. And in service means all the valves, all the subsystems are working correctly. So they were outside of compliance with their technical specifications. They were breaking the law by not having those valves open when they should have. And this was the contributing cause of the uh, Three Mile Island accident. Not the root cause, because the root cause is what ultimately would be the feed pump issues and the, fa and the faulty um, pressurizer relief valve that stuck open. But a contributing cause in that I don't think we would have had the accident would have been as severe if this was not the case. But there's more to it. The situation at Three Mile Island was in clear violation of those rules. While the meltdown was triggered by a mechanical failure, the situation was worsened by human error. The initiating event was triggered by human error. The meltdown or fuel damage, I would argue, would never have happened if it wasn't for human error. Because, um, w wait till you hear what they do next. The Three Mile Island incident serves as a reminder of the critical importance of both robust mechanical safety systems and foolproof controls in nuclear power plants. It highlights the need for attention to detail in design, where even minor aspects like the positioning of alarms on control panels can have far-reaching consequences, potentially leading to catastrophic meltdowns. To prevent- It says catastrophic meltdown, um, while nothing was actually Nothing's good associated with field damage. The fortunate thing is this one was contained. They had a reactor containment building, so no direct fatalities associated with the Three Mile Island event, unlike Chernobyl, which had several. Such incidents, future nuclear power plant designs must proactively address these issues. When the consequence of human error are nuclear meltdowns, there is no room for Keeps using the term nuclear meltdown, not really an industry term. I'm okay with him using it though, just to, to illustrate it, but fuel damage, core damage, generally more accepted because it, it's a more broad term that covers a wide range of fuel-induced failure, so I prefer that term. In Fukushima, an earthquake and its resulting tsunami.
Okay, so it sounds like he's done with Three Mile Island. He left off probably the biggest, worst aspect about Three Mile Island. So there's a couple of more things that happened. So he talked about that valve that stuck open in the primary systems with the pressurizer. So the operators didn't know that valve was stuck open because of a faulty limit switch. The, uh, the indication wasn't showing right, but what they should have done was looked at their alternate indication, that is to say the temperature in that line going up, that they should have known that they had a problem. Another critical error that these operators made was they thought they were filling up the pressurizer, which in fact they weren't, because if that valve gets stuck open, you're gonna have, you have water at the top of the pressurizer and this big nasty steam void in the center that's gonna mess up your indication. So they thought the pressurizer was full and they turned off their safety injection emergency core cooling system. The system turned on like it should have because pressure got too low because their relief valve was stuck open. But them turning off that system is what led to the fuel damage or the meltdown. If they would not have turned that off, I don't think any of us would really be talking about Three Mile Island at this point. Again, decent design. Um, there have been improvements. We have better indications now in, in modern control rooms, including many more sensors in the reactor vessel so you can tell whether or not you've actually have a um, steam void in your reactor vessel and could see this sort of accident coming. And we completely revamped our training and they've even been, We've even established a new regulatory body called the Institute of Nuclear Power Operations. They're not an official regulatory body, they're, they're an NGO, but their standards are much higher than that of the Nuclear Regulatory Commissions. Uh, those are the, uh, those are the uh, inspectors and, well, they're not, they're not inspectors, but the, uh, the peer review teams and uh, that everyone is more nervous about coming because they have much higher standards than the federal government for how we should operate these facilities. So operations training got a lot better, but he left out a few important details about why there's a lot more to the human error aspect problem with Three Mile Island than a design issue. The cooling systems in Fukushima depended on a separate energy source. The pumps that were needed to cool the reactors lost power, resulting in a catastrophic meltdown. The plant did have a back- Keeps using that term catastrophic meltdown. Uh, this one was worse because it affected uh, multiple multiple reactor reactors, and uh, there, were, um, there were a couple of fatalities associated with the nuclear part of this event, and over 20,000 people actually died as a result of this earthquake and tsunami, which is sad because when most people mention Fukushima, they talk about the nuclear thing rather than how horrific this earthquake and tsunami actually was. But I will agree that this one was, was worse than Three Mile Island. ...system which also failed. This need for external power to cool the reactors was a key disadvantage of this design. Fukushima also highlighted a weakness of current nuclear reactors the use of water as a coolant. Liquid water is a great conductor of heat and serves as a- Weakness of water. All right, I'm gonna listen to what he says, but I'm not sure about that. Plastic cooling agent. However, when control is lost, this water can lead to high pressure steam explosions, spreading radioactive materials across vast distances. For this reason, many new reactor designs- High pressure steam expl- Okay. Um. So you got to use something as a coolant, right? Um, I'm going to see what he gets into as the alternative. If he's going to talk about um, gas cooled reactors or liquid metal reactors, but they have their own source of limitations too. So there's steam explosions. There's hydrogen explosions, which are just a, more of a function of the fuel cladding than the coolant though. And that's what that's, that's probably the bigger hazard at, at play here. And that is with uh, zir zirconiums reacting with the water and causing hydrogen. So how we protect ourselves against the Fukushima event today is with additional uh, power supplies for our safety systems to remove decay heat. And 
And the plant I worked at, they were in the form of diesel generators placed on the top of buildings, buildings upwards of 60 feet tall. So the plant I worked at wasn't really vulnerable to tsunamis, but just in case anything that affects the diesels in lower areas, we have them on higher areas. And there are facilities in the U.S. that could bring in additional power supplies, hoses, emergency equipment to respond to a Fukushima type event, the uh, extended loss of AC power event that they could be brought in by helicopter if necessary. So we've definitely modified and get given us a third and fourth string backup systems for our backup systems, for our backup systems, for our primary systems. <laughs> seek to incorporate passive cooling systems which require no external power source one thing just to point out the visuals he's been using um they've all been like the secondary non-nuclear part of the plant like he just showed a turbine a turbine building now he's showing uh heat exchangers so haven't really seen any of the nuclear stuff yet in this video and aim to replace water with safer cooling mediums before discussing these future designs, there is another large problem facing nuclear energy. It's waste. Light water reactors operate in what is called an open fuel cycle. In this cycle, the uranium gets mined, processed, enriched, used, and then stored, leaving us with barrels of radioactive waste that governments have been struggling to deal with. In the US... It's not really stored in barrels. Nuclear fuel is stored off-site in dry cask storage containers, which are completely safe. Um, these things can resist direct strikes with missiles, explosives, severe weather, and they can be placed on a bet on outside on a pad for decades, if not centuries. That's what we're doing on at the at the nuclear power plant that I worked at as well as many others. So, and th this is the worst aspect, the spent fuel, the, the high level waste associated with nuclear power plants. Here's what it looks like inside one. Many, many layers uh, with these lids walled off by concrete, kept cooled, no risk of opening one of these things. Not sure what he means when he says it's risky or unsafe. There have been plans to create deep geological storage facilities 660 meters below Yucca Mountain. This has been the plan since the 1980s, but hasn't been put into action. So nuclear fuel is being stored in dangerous interim storage facilities. Dude, they're not they're not dangerous. <laughs> what is dangerous about these? They're they're a super they're the most secure. I I don't I don't get it scattered around the country. As is the case with most nuclear energy projects, it has faced delays and a lack of funding. And the barrels, so barrels are for the more low-level uh, stuff. Barrels usually involves like protective clothing that people wear in uh, contaminated areas. And the lower stuff can either be cleaned, like just by doing laundry, basically, or you can store them in temporary on-site things that you just need to wait a few days, months to for it to decay away. But a lot of it can be can be cleaned. Obama, Trump, and Biden have all failed to address this looming ecological threat. Don't make it a political issue. It's it's not a it's not a threat. I don't I don't see what the threat is. Waste management issues have continually caused political. And these are as guarded as the actual nuclear power plants are. So very secure facilities. I, I don't get it. Thermoil. Shipments of nuclear waste from France to Germany have been met with thousands of protesters. A key driver of political pushback on the development of nuclear energy. So is there an engineering solution to this logistical concern? Of course, adequate long-term storage is possible. Sweden has approved. Yeah, those, all those barrels that you see there are low level. They say radioactive, but they're not nearly as radioactive as like your spent fuel pool. Those sort of things are considered low level waste. Large storage repositories here in Frostmac. 
Finland has made similar arrangements to store its nuclear waste here. This Finnish deep geological repository is expected to come online within a year. Deep geological repositories are sophisticated engineered systems that employ multiple layers of protective barriers to isolate the spent fuel from the surrounding environment. What if we could make use of this nuclear waste, rather than locking it away for centuries like some sort of supernatural Zelda villain? Nuclear waste. Alright, okay buddy. So, I know he's making a joke. It's not like some sealed evil monster thing that's gonna come out. And those yellow barrels, that's, that's not a thing. That's, those yellow barrels with nuclear waste are as unrealistic as said Zelda villain. But, yeah, you can, so an underground repository is nice, just that it's a convenient spot to amass all these, and it would be good to have a longer term solution than decades to centuries. This would last a lot longer. Um... I think he's going to talk about reprocessing next. Um, I'm all for it. Let's see what he says. It can be recycled. During the early development of nuclear power, uranium was thought to be a The waste in those barrels he's showing is recycled, but I think we're talking spent fuel pool. We're, we're talking spent fuel at this point. ...resource. So a lot of research was directed into creating closed fuel cycles, where the spent uranium would be reprocessed and recycled. But the assumption of limited uranium was wrong. Uranium is very common in the Earth's crust. It's much cheaper to mine, enrich and process uranium than it is to recycle nuclear waste into workable fuel. Hence the adoption of the open fuel cycle. This is the system currently operating on most nuclear reactors with new waste piling up every minute. Recycling spent nuclear fuel is just a matter of separating unused uranium from the fission products. This process is not new. It was developed in the 1950s, and the basic steps are still used today in France and in Japan. The main reasons why it's not used in the United States is more of a proliferation concern, because in, in reprocessing, there is just additional nuclear fuel stuff that can allegedly be used to make weapons, but it would be hard it would be really hard to do that. If you're it's already being done in other countries, the the bad guys are going to go there rather than the U.S. anyway, so these arguments don't make a whole lot of sense to me. France, for example, cools its nuclear waste here. For three years it sits there before moving to the reprocessing steps. With the added cost and the potential of extracting plutonium for nuclear weapons, the Carter administration banned U.S. recycling facilities in 1977. What kills me is Jimmy Carter was... Uh, in the Navy on a nuclear submarine. So he at least had some nuclear operations, nuclear engineering background, and this is what he did. I don't, I don't get it. This recycled fuel can go back into regular light water reactors, or it could go into new reactor designs. Two common themes in new generation reactors is passive cooling and high thermal efficiencies through high temperature coolants. Light water reactors are limited to operating at around 300 degrees Celsius. Above this temperature, the high pressure water begins to boil. Thermal efficiency is how much electrical energy we can produce from thermal energy. And in general, this efficiency gets- 300, 300 Celsius is about right. The number I'm used to is 592 Fahrenheit, which figures out to, to pretty good. Better with higher temperatures. To increase efficiency, future nuclear reactors can switch the coolant to some one thing is, so this thermal cycle is not n unique to nuclear. Um, so you can increase the primary or you can lower the external. And this happens naturally in the winter time. The circulating water, uh, which cools the uh, condenser for the main turbine, because it's just an open pond, it gets colder in the winter. So our plant actually gets more efficient in the winter time. And you'll see that it can change by you know, a good 20 or so megawatts electric that can handle higher temperatures. In the early 2000s, the US Department of Energy decided to create the Gen 4 International Forum. It was composed of the best scientists from around the world to direct policy decisions and funding for new reactor designs. They chose a total of six new reactor technologies and coined them Generation 4 Reactors. Instead of using water as a coolant, Gen 4 reactors can use gas, supercritical water, molten salts, molten lead, or sodium to increase the operating temperature of the reactor. 
this increase in efficiency will result in less nuclear waste per gigawatt generated. Okay, per per gigawatt. So just just being increased efficiency. Again, you could you could all, you could technically also throw some ice cubes ice cubes in your cooling pond, <laughs> which would give you the same result, which is interesting. These designs also aim to increase passive cooling capabilities and limit nuclear proliferation risks. One of the most interesting prospects is the molten salt reactor, or- Limit proliferation, so I think I'll talk a bit more about the salt ones in a bit, but I would, they might actually have a higher risk of proliferation. MSR. In these reactors, the coolant and the radioactive fissile material are all combined. The basic premise of these reactors was tested and experimented with during the 1960s at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. In a molten salt reactor, the fuel consists of nuclear fuel, such as uranium or thorium, dissolved in a molten salt mixture. The salts typically used are fluorides or chlorides, which have high melting points and good heat transfer properties. The fuel salt circulates through the reactor core, absorbing heat generated by the nuclear fission. After it passes through the core... So the higher temperatures, so it does have its advantage in that you, you can have more efficiency, but they're not without their disadvantages. They're also susceptible to freezing because it's this, just a, a salt that we're talking about if temperature were to get too low. So they're going to require more reactor control compared to water that's going to stay liquid the entire time. Fuel salt transfers heat to a secondary salt coolant loop. The secondary loop, which does not contain fissile material, absorbs the heat from the fuel salt and carries it to the heat exchanger. In the heat exchanger, the heat from the secondary salt is transferred to a separate working fluid, typically water, which then powers a steam generator. Yeah, you'd so you're still gonna need to use a lot of water to power your to power your steam generator and then drive a turbine. You're not gonna put molten salt into an actual turbine. So his point about water earlier, and of course the demand on using water, this is gonna be a more resource intensive prospect or project. Since the coolant they use does not need to be at high pressure, like the water cooled reactors in Fukushima, salt reactors are not at risk of high temperature steam explosion. The primary side, you're still going to be ha going to need some high pressure in f for your actual turbine just to get your turbine to work well. So you're still going to need pressure vessels, but again, they won't be in the primary side. Instead, you're going to have ultra high temperatures. While light water reactors typically have a thermal efficiency of around 30%, molten salt reactors have been theorized to achieve efficiencies between 40 to 45%. I question that. So first off, 1% is ginormous <laughs> for nuclear power plants. Um, we spent um, over $50 million for a modification to a to one of our turbines to improve efficiency by 1%. The payback period was reasonable. So yeah, 1% is huge. But 40 to 45%, we're approaching like your ideal or Carno cycle efficiency here just talking about the temperature difference and you know there's going to be losses associated with the molten salt having another heat exchange system to to translate that heat to water in your turbine um system so i think that is very very optimistic I still think they'll, they'll probably still be more of have a greater thermal efficiency than light water reactors, but for, I don't think we're going to see 40%. Molten salt reactors also have the potential for inline fuel processing, which means that while the reactor is operating, the fuel salt can be continuously reprocessed to remove fission products and add new fuel, meaning the machine can run continuously without stopping for refueling. So can do reactors, which are a heavy water reactor, they operate the same way. Um, you can j I joke with uh, some of the operators I know there, uh, rotisserie style uh, nuclear power where you can continuously refuel, but you're still gonna have to shut down the plant to repair things in the turbine building because turbines, heat exchangers still need to be replaced. So keeping it running 24 seven, you're still probably gonna have to, sh have to shut it down on the order of 
every two to three years or so, even if it's even if it's not for refueling purposes, just to uh, to do all that maintenance. At first glance, you'll notice that the system needs not one but two pumps. However, these reactors can yeah. safely cool down even when power is lost to these pumps. The salt's chemical properties naturally inhibit further nuclear fission as temperatures increase. The exact mechanisms of this depend on the salt's composition, but generally, as the molten salt gets hotter, it expands. This expansion decreases the volume of fuel in the core of the reactors, and therefore decreases the rate of nuclear fission. Meaning, the hotter it gets, the less fission occurs, helping prevent that's true in the case of light water reactors as well. You heat up the reactor coolant, it's going to... reactivity is going to go down too. And also, I talked about voids earlier. You increase the number of voids, the reactor is going to shut itself down in that case too, because water also moderates the neutrons, and if you're not moderating them, they're not going to cause fission. So... This is so this is good. This is encouraging, but it's not it's not an advantage it has over light water reactors. Nuclear meltdown. A freeze plug is also located at the bottom of the liquid salt pool. The freeze plug is designed to melt at a particular temperature. In the event of an uncontrolled rise in temperature, the plug will melt and allow the fuel and molten salt to passively drain into cooled dump tanks. So that's an example of a passive uh, safety system. Freeze plug melts, it drops there, so, cool. Molten salt reactors are some time away from commercial readiness, and that problem extends to all other fourth generation reactors, despite significant support from proponents. Molten salt, so they, they have some extra challenges as well. Um, so, the waste associated from that, less in volume, but it's weird because it's got this frozen molten salt stuff that we don't really know what to do with yet. So the waste, I would say, is an even higher level than your typical spent fuel than you would get in a light water reactor. I'm confident we can figure out how to work, how, how to get it to work, but that's going to add some unique challenges. Another thing is you're going to need a chemical plant right next to this nuclear plant to to manufacture all of this molten salt for you. And yeah, it's gonna have just all the hazards that you would normally expect with a chemical plant. Granted, this will be a nuclear chemical plant, so hope hopefully it'll at least get the benefit of some of those uh, regulations and um, technical specifications that you see within nuclear, but that's gonna add a whole bunch of cost and oversight and other things that's just going to get it that's going to make it more expensive than you initially thought um plus for one i was good working at a nuclear plant because the only waste product really being water as far as emissions and the nuclear waste was done in such a safe way but working with but with some of these other hazardous chemicals that's Let's just say I didn't want to work at a petrochemical plant. Now you're adding chemicals that might turn off a few people from wanting to work there. <laughs> and no, so not against molten salt reactors. I'm all for new technology, new um, innovations, but it's not without challenges. And I don't I don't think it's better than the current uh, light water reactor designs and the advanced light water reactor designs that are coming out as well. I wonder if he's going to talk more about some of those. These technologies. The fourth generation International Forum originally proposed that most of these technologies would be ready by 2020. But based on the fact that the only footage available is from the 1960s, that has not come. No, it's it's really unfortunate, but I, I would really like to see more stuff. And there's such a gap in technology because a lot of this, like you said, is from the 60s and 70s. Uh, salt reactors, um, gas-cooled reactors, uh, fast neutron reactors, breeder reactors. It just all got shut down so hard with, with public opinion. If you think of where we'd be at now if things would have continued to develop the way they did in the 1960s and 70s, then man, it would be so cool. Fruition. Lack of funding and competition from low cost solar and wind has held back development of these fourth generation technologies. 
Reason why solar and wind is low cost is because of the heavy subsidies they get. This problem is only going to continue until nuclear energy addresses its largest problem, cost. Since 2003, MIT has been conducting studies specifically aimed at guiding researchers and policymakers towards a viable future for nuclear energy. In their latest report, they stated that the utmost importance must be given to lowering the cost of nuclear plants. And thus, the most promising ideas seek to address these cost issues. While deep geological repositories, uranium reprocessing and Gen 4 reactors had the brunt of work done during the 1900s, a new design concept started- <laughs> The 1900s, yeah. Technically, yeah, but I'm just picturing like, when you said that, I'm picturing in like 1908, people uh, splitting atoms with really small hammers or something. It gave me a bit of a chuckle. ...emerge in the early 2000s. Small modular reactors, or SMRs for short, the goal of this design to is to miniaturize reactors and convert them into small, standardized modules that can be fabricated in factories. This standardization could not only decrease costs, but inherently increases their reliability and safety as complexity is removed from the manufacturing and assembly while decreasing on-site construction costs. Couple of other advantages. Uh, Full-scale nuclear reactors can't go in every single situation. Because you you just need a good bit of physical space to uh, to house them. So you could have like small modular reactors in a mountainous region or a more desert region that you don't need as large of uh, infrastructure, water sources, that sort of stuff to uh, to keep them going. So you can have them in much smaller communities, and that's just really cool. Small modular reactors work in much the same way as regular nuclear plants, but with smaller individual reactors that can work in expandable modules, gradually increasing the output of a power plant with cheaper factory-made modules, rather than building one large custom-designed nuclear power plant with 1000 megawatts of electricity capacity. Making the reactor smaller also comes with the big benefit of passive safety. A smaller reactor has more surface area for heat transfer to occur in proportion to the volume of material that needs Good old square cube law. Meaning natural convection cycles are sufficient to cool the reactor. As the coolant is heated, it rises due to its lower density, establishing a natural flow pattern that drives the cooling process. SMRs are not defined as one type of nuclear reactor or design. Rather, they are a family of designs that take advantage of the miniaturization of the technology. Because just like anything else, the same was true with talking about uh, liquid metal reactors. This, no one SMR is like the other. Some use Gen 4 reactors, others use light water reactors. Currently, over 70 commercial small modular reactors are being developed. NewScale may be the most promising of all these companies. Their most recent 77 megawatt they're approved by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. That is a major, major step. And I already know a few investors that, that are interested in these. Module is around 20 meters tall and 4.5 meters in diameter. Each of these modules is lowered into a water bath and set on seismic isolators. This makes sure that any earthquakes do not affect the reactor. All of the components needed for the nuclear reaction are fitted in one steel containment vessel. To create a larger plant, multiple modules are connected together. If power to the reactor is lost, control rods fall automatically in a gravity-driven mechanism, and the containment vessel seals its valves to isolate itself. The water from the core is boiled off as steam, but still- Yeah, beautiful. Pure, passive safety. A uh, pretty good description of that, too. Inside the containment vessel, transferring heat with the outside cooling pool, the steam condenses and pools at the bottom of the reactor vessel creating a natural circulation of cooling water inside the steel containment vessel. Within seconds, the reactor operators call that process a uh, burp and slurp. Energy and temperature drop drastically, and within a day, the thermal power drops by 90%, cooling off the last 10% over the course of weeks. And while this all sounds great, we are nowhere near commercial deployment. NewScale is by far the most ahead, but have only managed to create a I'd say we're the closest we've ever been. These are far, far closer than that than those liquid metal reactors that, that we were talking about earlier. I could, I could actually see these happening within a few years. Third scale model of their power plant. 
Other countries like Russia, China, France and South Korea have also invested in creating SMR technologies, but have struggled to find utility customers. Without potential customers, these startups will always fail in a capitalist system. Even NewScale has been dropped by some utility there's a few that I've that I've seen. Let's let's see what he says. The clients, as their prices seem to have exceeded expectations, this poses a massive challenge. So I saw that went up so much since 2017. They are not immune to the same building costs of literally everything else that has happened after COVID. Um, I've I've noticed that with commercial construction. I've noticed that for things like projects just around the house have gone up by that 50 to 75 percent margin. So it has nothing to do with the fact that it's nuclear. It's everything's more expensive. It's competitors. Wind and solar are more expensive now, too. Companies that rely on large scale standardized factories to achieve their key market advantage to build the factory. They need customers, but they can't get customers without the factory. Thousands of reactors will need to be built before economies of scale can kick in. Uh, uh, not thousands. Um, several. Do I would say dozens, but thousands for... And so economies of scale isn't like an on or off switch. You'll, you'll gradually see things as they go. As someone who's managed large capital projects associated with nuclear before, um, you'll notice it by... Number two, number three, and then you'll continue to refine that. And I've seen savings of, granted, they're they're logarithmic. They um, there's a bit of diminishing returns, but I've seen them um, upwards of ten percent for iteration. So, just like what we've seen with wind and solar, they were so so expensive back in like the mid 2000s, what 2010, that sort of thing. And now they're being deployed a lot more. We just need this technology to mature. And in reality, the exact reason traditional nuclear reactors produce so much electricity is to benefit from the economies of scale. Building a 1000 megawatt reactor reduces the cost per megawatt. And that's the most important True. metric in the electricity market. That's how you get grid operators to buy your electricity, by making it cheaper. NewScale's original price point was $55 per megawatt hour. However, due to inflation, rising steel costs, development issues, and many delays, the costs are now estimated at $100 per megawatt hour. Okay, so inflation, steel costs are going to affect every, all of the above, not just, um, not just the new scale portion of that. So that doesn't really change anything. It just means everything's expensive and it's going to slow down the development of everything. In comparison, onshore wind and solar can be as cheap as $30 per megawatt hour. With Not with that same price increase. They just need the same subsidies that renewables get just to level the playing field. Then you can realize that same sort of savings you get just to, just to help everyone out the same way. Threat of climate change looming over us, we need to ask ourselves. Can we rely on a capitalist system to fix a problem driven by capitalism? There Whoa. Okay. <laughs> that, mm, that's not, this isn't real. We've gone beyond engineering now, haven't we? We've gone into economics. So first and foremost, disclaimer, not an economist. But global climate change, it was by industrialization, not just capitalism there was heavy industry in communist countries as well and countries with more of an authoritarian centralized along that spectrum drifting towards command economy as well it's was more of just the act of industrializing and no <laughs> to say it was entirely caused by capitalism i i don't buy that a distinct possibility that these technologies will never succeed without government funding. Energy generation. So, without government funding, so then subsidies. I don't. Yeah. <laughs> is the foundation of every major world economy, and it is in countries' best interest to invest in these technologies. Nuclear energy provides energy security. 
The US is not alone in trying to develop the technology. China has embarked on the construction of a functional small modular reactor project here. However, similar to many nuclear ventures, costs have significantly escalated, with the SMR reportedly being twice as expensive in terms of cost per kilowatt hour compared to a traditional large-scale nuclear plant. That's because it's new technology. You have to develop it and you have to practice. You have to go through those uh, these somewhat painful tra uh, transitional periods just like with any new technology. I mean, we saw that we saw it with wind and solar about 10, 15 years ago. Canada has formulated a, tw a 2020 SMR action plan to help bring down costs and have invested millions of dollars into SMR startups. Developing these technologies will need vastly more money than this, but it's a step in the right direction. Wind and solar are game-changing technologies that we could only have dreamed of being as cheap as they are today, two decades ago. But we need every tool at our disposal to fight climate change, not just to decarbonize our energy. I thought he was going to say it. He had that opportunity that we're imaginably cheap. I mean, we could be that way 20 years from now with putting the right steps. And I don't actually think it's going to take 20 years, but um, towards those investments, it's just like compounding interest associated with anything else. What we do, the knowledge we gain, the manufacturing um, skills that we gain, which is we haven't done anything like this in a while as far as large scale manufacturing, but let's just, let's take those lessons we learned from renewables and make something even better. Generation, but to start fighting the effects of climate change, population growth and global industrialization from increasing demand for air conditioning, water scarcity driving the need for energy intensive water desalination, to last ditch efforts to reverse climate change with carbon capture. Energy is the cause and solution to our problems. The transition from- Transportation actually makes up a larger percentage of greenhouse gas emissions than energy, but I get, I get what he's saying. Fossil fuels, in my opinion, is the most pressing issue facing humanity. This is an all hands on deck problem. We need our best minds working on it. So I agree with the message at the end about let's all work together and develop these really cool technologies. There is just a bit of a uh, stuff like the whole talk on capitalism and the, the differences in designs that I thought were somewhat lacking. But overall, I thought this was a pretty good video in terms of a call to action. I love these sort of things. They still get me all uh, fired up. Uh, but let me know what you thought. Um, and also, what technology what are you the most excited about seeing? Is it small modular reactors? The liquid metal ones? Gas cooled ones? Fusion? Let me know what you thought about that and what, what you think are the most exciting ones that you'd like to see in the near future. Again, if you like new exciting nuclear technology please uh join me on my journey to a clean sustainable nuclear energy future by liking subscribing and commenting thank you very much i'll see you next time